I, I realize I'm, I'm probably the only one, but that's okay. I'll, I'll try and look respectable. You always look respectable. <laughs> <laughs> Have you met Saksham? Uh, I don't think so. Hey, how are you, Saksham? Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I'm Saksham. I'm a, I'm a resident at Brigham. Thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. What, what year are you? Fourth year. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Saksham was a student at uh, HMS, and despite my warnings, he decided to go into neurosurgery. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry to hear that. I know. <laughs> it's okay. I'm halfway done. It's almost there. Yeah. And he wants to do global neurosurgery, Jim. What do you are think? You, uh, are you similar year to like Josh Bernstock? Yeah. Yeah. He saw this flyer and actually mentioned, he was like, how do you know Dr. Johnson? I was like, I don't, I'm going to meet him today. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, Josh is a great guy. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. He's my core, uh, one of my two core residents. I've known him for okay, some time. Nice. And then Ramya is um, the other co-host. She's a medical student at University of Florida. Gain is it Jacksonville? Ramya? Gainesville. Gainesville. I swoop. Yep. <laughs> He's had problems with that. Nice to meet you, Dr. Johnson. I'm so glad nice you. you're able to join us today. Oh yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for thanks for asking. Of course, our pleasure. Oh look, Mac joining joining us. That's great. All right, we figured out all these functions just in time. Key, can you can you give me an overview of what what the who the audience is for this? Yeah, so we went out to our uh, typical our, our standard mailing list of global neurosurgery interest group. Uh, so mm -hmm. that involves um, uh, usually con you know, includes students, uh, mm -hmm. medical students, residents, and even uh, neuros practicing neurosurgeons, not just in the U.S. but globally. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I, I sent it out to some people who are interested in the intersection between technology and innovation and uh, entrepreneurship and, 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 and uh, global surgery, right? Not just global neurosurgery. So, yeah. You know. Oh, you pinned Mac? <laughs> yeah, you, you might just want to listen. I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Kay. How are you? Hi, Mac. Yeah, we, 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 you don't, we don't have to put, put a spotlight on you. It's okay. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for inviting me. I'm sure. looking forward to listening. So uh, thank you. Yeah, Max hey, with- I... Oh yeah, sorry, Keith. Go ahead, Go ahead, Jane. Can I ask you a dumb question? Is my background, is it, is it backwards? No. The building is on the right. No, but like, is the, is the word, is the wording backwards or is it no, right? it's correct. Perfect, great, okay. It's the same thing with me. What I, I mirror mine. Otherwise, I get yeah. all goofy when I do like this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I, I'm assuming. But you know, sometimes I'm looking at it going, wait, is it backwards for everybody? And you know, no. I, what I'm in my screen, it's it's mirrored. Yeah. So okay. it's backwards. Okay, yeah. Perfect. So when I do a screenshot, my screen comes up backwards. <laughs> you know, so it's I have to unmirror. I think we'd have figured this out by now. How to make that. I mean, Tech and innovation, come on, yeah, let's right. figure this right. out. Yeah, when you do a screenshot, it should instantly unmirror, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff coming down the pike, James, uh, on technology innovation. Oh, yeah. It seems like building like crazy. Yeah, yeah no, it's, there's so much going on and, you know, we're, yeah, we are uh, excited to be kind of collaborating with your group and, and, you know, you guys are doing the, the, uh, the straightforward part. We are about 2000 into our 4,000 uh, paper review. So, yeah, yeah, don't wait too long. It's going to be 6,000 pretty soon. I know. No, I know it's, it's, you know, it wasn't my idea, frankly, I'm just, I'm going to follow up on doing the, um, what is it? Covidian? Is that COVID? Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID, yeah, COVID, yeah, whatever that is. And that, that yeah, is just COVID or something, or yeah. I think the, the librarians just they love to just run us down this road. They're like, how many do you think we can give them? Do you think they'll do 4,000? Oh, these guys, they'll do it. <laughs> oh, oh, it's crazy. Painful just thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So we have to. Make sure the others well obviously you 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 joined Jim so it's it's the correct uh, link there was been there's been some issues with um, which no, the, what, what happens with the registration and the link but one way or another people will find their way here mm -hmm.
we sort of helped our some of our partner uh, programs kind of develop their 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 um, programs to like next level uh, complicated uh, neurosurgical uh, interventions. Um, we've written about this in the past, and um, and again, it's sort of this three prong model which we found to be to be useful. Now, of course, with COVID, I think it really illustrated to us which was uh, which was always there, which is that you know we're limited in how we can train surgeons, uh, in that our model of training is really based on the Halstead model, which is that, you know, it takes a long time to learn how to, how to operate and take care of patients. Um, and that model is a, is a combination of didactics and, and lecture learning, which of course is important, but I would venture that, that things like residency training and the act of, of actually working in the operating room and working with experienced surgeons uh, and learning, observing, learning, and then being corrected in the OR, et cetera, is a very important component. And then I think the third component, which is also just as important, is that ongoing mentorship afterwards. Now, of course, when you try to, to take this model uh, to the global uh, you know, neurosurgery stage, it's, it's slowed down by things like time and distance. Um, you know, uh, we've got mentors who are you know, in developed health, health systems, whether it's neurosurgery or other surgical subspecialties, and then you have learners um, who want to learn, but the way that we we convey that information to date has been pretty outmoded. It requires you know a lot of money going to American Airlines and Hilton hotels, um, and 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 it's limited by our time. You know our ability to travel and the ability of 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 our learner uh, partners to to travel to visit us in their busy practices. And so, you know, the idea is how do you go about connecting people in a more um, direct and efficient manner. And of course, we all know that with things like webinars and things like this, it's become so much easier to convey information. Um, but I would venture that the next stage of that is how do you connect people in a much more network-based system? So instead of just attending a lecture, they can actually interact in a more meaningful way on a daily basis, um, not only with mentors, but with other learners so that over time, you know, learners become mentors and, and can really kind of, you know, really propagate and accelerate that, that capacity. So I guess the, the idea that, that I would submit is that we have to kind of add to our Halstead model, this idea of technology and how we go about improving that surgical approach. And the, the general ways I think about that is one is uh, you need to, a way to find each other. So social network connectivity, we're all very used, used to that now with things like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everything else. Um, software uh, and hardware that we can then use that doesn't interfere with our normal workflow that to basically share realities um, and be able to share our experience within that reality. And then uh, in the operating room, outside the operating room, before we operate, while we're operating, after we operate, et cetera. Um, and so from a social network connectivity, there's lots of ways that we do this. Um, I put my plug in for something that I've been working on for a while. Uh, Mr. William Harkness, uh, a pediatric a visionary pediatric neurosurgeon at Gray Norman Street who passed away last year, had this vision for inner surgeon. Um, and for those of you who don't know about it, I, I urge you to sign up. Um, and, and his fundamental recognition is that so, global surgery is a social network, meaning that it's not just surgeons, it's, it's, it's um, students and it's nursing and it's hospitals and departments and nonprofits and governments, et cetera. And to date, we don't really have a good way to really connect with each other and communicate um, what we're doing, what we need to do, what we want to do, et cetera. And so, you know, based on a decentralized social network architecture, we built this independent of all organizations as a way for people to find each other um, uh, with algorithms and, and, and searching, uh, the ability to search for other uh, programs based on and, and individuals based on what kind of surgery they do, what kind of interests they have, language they speak, uh, geographic, et cetera. So um, InterSurgeon has been fortunate to generate a, a number of partners uh, over the last uh, last few years, which uh, in the G4 Alliance I, I named specifically because they are really uh, um, right now the, the premier consortium and, and, and advocacy a group that represents uh, you know over 80 global surgery, uh, obstetrics, trauma, and anesthesia um, organizations in representation at the level of the WHO. And we are working very hard with them to, to provide a meaningful um, resource for all of their members to find each other, recruit new uh, surgeons and, 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 and individuals, for individuals to find organizations to work with, um, et cetera. So uh, 
we've recently uh, started a, a, a surgical or a, a strategic process, a strategic planning process with a, a professionalization of our uh, leadership, which I'm very excited uh, over the next few years, which I think is going to take it to the next level in terms of utility and the numbers of people uh, who will be on it. Right now, we have about 850 members in 107 countries, and we're looking for, for several thousand to 10,000 over the next several years to really make it a useful way to find each other. So, the second two things are things like software and hardware. And again, these things are what I'm going to show you today is pretty basic stuff, but I think it sort of gives you a taste as to the things that will be coming down the, down the line um, that are going to be available for for training. Um, you know, using uh, you know augmented reality is is become a lot more. Um, you know, everyone knows about it, and it's become incredibly useful or increasingly useful in our ORs. And the idea is, how do you adapt that for use across uh, wide distances uh, with um, limited bandwidth and limited uh, connectivity issues and electricity and costs and upgradability and all those kind of things. And so we, we found it to be quite useful with this help lightning augmented reality software uh, for uh, using uh, for training for neuroendoscopy for our partners in, in Vietnam, using pretty basic iPads and phones and that sort of thing. And I'm really excited about a, a project that we're doing now, uh, Ohana One is really the lead, you know, in the lead in all this. They're a nonprofit out of uh, Los Angeles that is doing really important work uh, using and evaluating the, the efficacy of, of really simple, cheap um, uh, uh, augmented reality, you know, smart glasses paired up with Help Lightning for uh, more than 50 surgical teams worldwide and evaluating it in a, in a, um, in a rigorous manner. Um, that is all ongoing right now. We have some of the neurosurgery data, um, which we are processing now, we'll be publishing soon. But in general, it's it's been quite useful, um, inexpensive, and, and implementation is is uh, is not a big deal. Although I, I'll, that's a caveat that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, and the way it works is is it's really easy. You know, like basically our partners in, in Vietnam can call us. That's Dr. Kanton Dongdo, who who's the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at children's number two. He's interested in improving his craniofacial uh, technique for more, you know, complicated multi-suture synostosis. And he can call in with myself and, and John Grant, who's my partner in plastic surgery, and we can review cases ahead of time. And then while he's operating, freeze the screen and do some pretty basic telestration and putting our hands in the field, et cetera, to, to help him as he, as he, as he improve, improves his repertoire. And we know it's been very useful because we did about six cases with him and he doesn't really call us anymore. So um, we've had similar experiences with um, uh, craniofacial program in, or a uh, cleft palate program in, in Ghana and, uh, and then uh, across uh, uh, the world with some of the experience that Ohana One has had with their teams that are using it. So again, this will be written up in a more uh, rigorous manner, I think, in the, in the coming year. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I think there's this obvious evolution in global surgical training, uh, the paradigm we're using, and you're going to be hearing some really exciting things, I think, uh, by other panelists today. And what I what I would, I guess what I'd urge everyone on the call today is to not think about it in terms of the technology or what the specific thing is that people are talking about, but how do you go about including it in your normal surgical um, practice and your normal surgical education, whether you're training your own residents or you're training residents in another part of the world. And the bigger question, I think, for, um, you know, for we're talking about global neurosurgery is how do you scale up these tools? Because it's not as simple as you think. You don't just write a paper about something that's really cool and give it to a few people and assume they're going to start using it and it'll be fine. There, there are some issues that go into that, things like implementation and how do you go about supporting things and getting people over that initial hump of being familiar with the technology so they integrate it into their system. You know, we've, we've been able to do that over years with our partners in Vietnam and Ghana, um, but it has not been, I think, as straightforward as, as, as you would think it would be. And I think those are things that need to be thought about as we go into this, um, this whole process. So th that's that's all I have to say on this. And, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm really interested to hear which, what everyone else thinks um, about specific technologies and some of these bigger questions I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, today. So thanks for the invitation and, and looking forward to um, talking more. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for that wonderful presentation. And I think um, it kind of lays the foundation for a lot of um, interesting work moving forward. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Um, and with that, we can move on to introducing our next panelist. Um, and let me just spotlight. 
And so I have the pleasure of introducing our next panelist, Tyler Alexander. Um, and so Tyler Alexander believes in the power of ideas. He has a background in astrophysics and neuroscience and co-founded Hoff Intelligence, which creates augmented reality applications to reduce medical errors amongst other things. To Tyler, a bridge between disciplines is essential to progress and success. It is Hoth's mission to provide the best care possible to patients and to fundamentally change the nature of medicine through augmented reality. Hoth is doing just that. And so with that, I'd like to invite Tyler Alexander to teach us more about the exciting work that he's doing at Hoth Intelligence. Thanks so much, Tyler. Great, thanks everybody. Um, thanks for that uh, uh, previous talk, that, that was great. And actually really segues nicely um, with what I'm going to discuss today. Um, again, thank you, um, uh, uh, Keith, as well, um, as well as Ramya for inviting uh, me to share. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Hoth and, and how this fits into the global context. Um, so let me first share with you what we do and, and who we are. And um, we are one of those augmented reality uh, software companies that, that was just mentioned, and um, we're thinking about a lot of these problems. And so this is us and what we believe. One of the problems that we're starting with, just to get everybody on the same page, for those of you who may be listening who aren't you know, as familiar with these sorts of procedures, are head and neck based procedures, um, for instance, external ventricular drains. These are procedures where providers make an incision in the scalp, drill a hole in the skull, and then try to insert a catheter to target a structure known as the ventricles. Um, in a lot of cases, providers will do this, uh, even in, in the States. So forgetting about the global context for a second, um, providers will do this just by kind of looking at a patient uh, sitting up in, in bed. And these, these you know, have, have massive consequences on lives, cost, you know, time and, and staff and resources, which, which are, 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 you know, in, in some cases, even more costly in the global context. And so I'll just share with you what we're doing and, and then we can start thinking about how this technology relates to and applies to global surgery. And so, so what we're doing is providing augmented reality overlays such that when a provider looks at a patient wearing a pair of glasses that providers actually able to effectively see inside of a patient uh, when performing these procedures so that they never or so that their chances of missing are, are much less. And let me just tell you how this works. What we do is we take a patient specific CT scan or MRI scan. We reconstruct that in 3D, load that into the Microsoft HoloLens 2 headset and then we're just using the Microsoft HoloLens 2 headset, which is a pair of glasses with our own facial tracking software, such that you look at a person's face and we call it facial tracking, but it actually works for, for anything else. But you look at a person's face and then that patient specific 3D object is actually overlaid with the patient. I'll point out um, some dependencies here that you can think about and then I'll circle back to in the global context. Number one, we're dependent right now if you want to operate on a preoperative CT or MRI scan, depending on the context, that may be challenging to get to. I worked in Haiti for about three years and the using the scanner was very challenging and took a lot of time. In addition, um, we, we also uh, require a HoloLens 2 headset. This is like a $3,500 device um, uh, and, you know, requires connectivity. Um, however, um, I think that this is uh, extremely powerful and impactful for a variety of reasons. You can, you know, when these procedures are done wrong, EVD or other procedures, you can reduce, you know, healthcare burden on the system by reducing ICU stays, increasing hospital throughput, you know, saving costs, which has, you know, cost saving as, as well as, you know, avoiding have corrective, you know, uh, problems, um, and and again, overall reducing the burden um, in the you know context of of global surgery. And so, I'll just put this technology in context of you know global surgery and global health and the different sorts of procedures 
um, that people may think about this augmented reality technology uh, being applied to and some of the things that we're thinking of uh, as this applies. You know, number one, I think one of the advantages of what we're building um, at Auth in this software solution really is the footprint. So um, everything, you know, operates out of that headset, which I could fit in a backpack um, and carry pretty much anywhere. So that's that's huge. You're, you're expanding access that way. But, but thinking about how this applies without some sort of CT or MRI scan, you can already even use this to improve access to education um, and, and, and you know, open up the, the a number of educational opportunities to folks and not only improve access, but you can also actually improve the overall quality of the education, which is this third point here, because the, the um, ability of somebody to actually better understand or better visualize um, something um, uh, using AR technology uh, can can be greatly enhanced. These are all things, by the way, that we've kind of studied in our study. And then the last thing is, you know, ultimately what we all want is, is better care. And and so I think even, you know, pre uh, 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 or without having a CT or an MRI scan, um, uh, just kind of using different models even um, of, of, of objects, this could be, you know, used to improve education. But then, of course, it can be enhanced if there's access to, you know, MRI, et cetera. So, so some challenges and some questions and some of these things were actually previously mentioned. Um, and so I'll just highlight a couple. Um, one is connectivity. Um, our software and a lot of, I think, emerging software um, uh, can operate in offline mode, um, um, but, but they will require typically like some sort of high-speed connectivity to work. Um, we're talking like partners like T-Mobile or things like that that could provide a you know, 5G connection, um, or things like Starlink, um, you know, to provide, uh, you know, low cost internet, but with different sorts of bands. Um, cost <laughs> for augmented reality solutions. How do you keep a, a, the solution, you know, cost effective, especially for, you know, this expensive headset when you may need multiple uh, headsets? Um, and and how, what about the cost of, you know, providing, you know, the, all of that data processing, all of that? Um, and then over engineering um, and scale. And so I do want to put this into context and I'll touch on this in a later slide, but how do we ensure that, you know, this kind of high power augmented reality solution is, is not like over engineering <laughs> for maybe like a different, you know, um, a problem that, that you know, uh, 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 we, we want to solve differently. And so this is, you know, kind of one of the last slides that I'll, that I'll uh, almost end on other than that before I can, Include, which is, you know, to put this augmented reality solution, which provides really incredible, you know, um, uh, overlays to help visualize targets, you could definitely envision, you know, on the global scale places without, um, you know, uh, high powered, you know, visualization or like image guidance uh, tools, being able to use, you know, $3,500 headset, uh, which is much less expensive or and smaller than you know, a lot of other equipment um, to, to do this. But, but really, I do want to bring attention to understanding, which is our philosophy, you know, the core problem based on different geographic contexts, you know, globally, every problem can be slightly different. And then again, how can we apply this technology, whether it's neuro-based or EVD or some other sort of procedure, how can we most effectively apply the technology again so we're not over-engineering the um, solution and, and that we're really providing a, a, a benefit, uh, which I think you know, is, is, is very clear and possible, but, but again, all these sorts of questions have to be taken into context. So um, um, I'll kind of stop there. I have, I have a slide where I can talk about like the different like sorts of procedures we're able to enter, which do involve like EVDs, drill drains, you know, the ability to operate in simulation, enter the operating room, but um, I, I don't want to get too much into that. I want to just kind of frame it and, and kind of leave it there. So happy to take questions. Again, really appreciate everybody's time and uh, excited to, to have the opportunity to share and, and see where this goes um, more on the global and international scale. So thanks.
So, so Tyler, um, is the the AR, you know, the 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 AR that you're providing is is an image, right? It's like a CT or an MRI onto the anatomy. Do you have any plans for other information modalities that you'll be able to put in there, or 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 how do you guys where do you see that going? Yeah, so we do. Um, so we're we're um, right now just operating with uh, CT and them. So I have a background actually originally uh, in astrophysics and image processing. And so CT and MRI, you know, image processing is um, a little bit easier, but we can incorporate other sorts of imaging modalities. Um, the way that we actually register is markerless. So, you, so it, I mean, we're saying it's facial registration, but it's actually pretty much anything you can register to. Um, and so as long as those structures deeper to the surface are visible, whatever imaging modality it is, we can reconstruct that and then, you know, overlay it. Yeah. So like x-ray, I don't know, you may be thinking, right, like x-ray or like other sorts of things. Um, I, I, I have a we, more technical, about that. I have a more technical question to ask Tyler. Um, Jim, thank you for your question. But um, the tracking is critical. And you you uh, you keep mentioning facial recognition, um, where you know all the neurosurgeons recognize that when you put in the EVD, you're not looking at the face. So how do you track when you when you can't see the face? Yeah, so great question. So this is like a little bit more into just how the technology works. So the initial uh, so so there are a couple of solutions. Um, one solution is you. Well, let me just preface this you initially register based on the face, right? So this is, a, it doesn't have to be like the full face. It could be like, you know, patients like intubated or something like that, which is fine. But you initially register based on the face. Then the two solutions that can extend from there are either the face is fully visible. As you said, that's very likely not the scenario. So there are other sorts of solutions that we can do. One is you have the head pinned. And so if the head is pinned, then whether you move around the head or not, as long as you registered based on the face, uh, we have like stability algorithms that keep it in the same spot, even if you like move around or cover it. If you want the face or head to move, the other solution, if the face is not visible, would be potentially some sort of like a Bluetooth uh, marker or um, like a, like small like a QR code or something like that that you've probably seen and like other sorts of you know, AR based like solutions that you could either attach to somebody that's visible to the headset or something that's not visible, but that's registered by the headset, but the headset can still, you know, hear um, and then, you know, track and co register to that. Yeah. And then both of those things are things that we've built out uh, for, by the way. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. Uh, that was an amazing talk. Uh, and we'll have some more time for questions at the end, too. Um, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our next panelist, um, Dr. Uh, Rahman Bhavana. Um, Dr. Bhavana, oops, sorry, my apologies. Dr. Bhavana is a neurosurgeon at the NRI Institute of Medical Sciences in uh, Visakhapatnam, India. He graduated from the Andhra Medical College in the same city in 2018. And um, he has pioneered the use of the foldoscope in stratifying brain tissue examples. His work has been presented at multiple international conferences, and he hopes to further test the foldoscope in areas with low healthcare access and infrastructure to provide uh, better neurosurgical care there. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Bhavana and hear more about his work. Thank you for having, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the people for uh, inviting me into this, uh, on this uh, uh, global program. And I sincerely thank you, Dr. Deepak, uh, for uh, inviting me to this. Uh, Without any delay, I'd like to share my screen. Uh, so, uh, what is the uh, general problem which I faced uh, after completion of my 2018 in neurosurgery residency is uh, uh, normally a uh, Taiwan city where uh, you can see uh, each hospital is equipped with an in-house pathologist and a surgeon. So whenever a surgeon does, a we need this vast psychology, you can immediately call the pathologist. But when we, when we, when we are going to type two and type three cities, uh, where the 
processing to pathology ratio is very very less. So each pathology uh, surgeon has to cover around three to four hospitals, uh, and also in type three city, city like uh, there is a very very few uh, pathologists compared to the surgeon. So surgeon literally has to wait for the splash cytology uh, report to come back to him, uh, and he can go further. So he has three issues here that uh, which uh, the folder scope which I could address that. If you could get a slide at the operating table or any OP basis like upper J endoscopy biopsies or SNSs, uh, we need a splash cytology. If it is an easy procedure, we can get, get them fastly. And uh, we need a microscope for every surgeon, which should be affordable, which should carry easily in his pocket. And uh, after the process uh, in the slide, taking the picture of the slide, he has to easily transport uh, into the phone and uh, transport to a distant pathologist or expert in uh, neuro or uh, any other branch. So they should tell you medicine. So these three things I, uh, I have to address. So since 2018, I'm searching uh, which is the best microscope uh, which I can carry with me wherever I go. So in 2018, uh, seeing NAS daily, uh, I came uh, to this uh, uh, clipping and I started doing with this folder scope. So uh, what my intention is, uh, I used to compare the slides uh, which I had done through foldoscope and uh, also see the processing time uh, done through the foldoscope and compare it with the conventional microscope, uh, which is done in the type 1 type 3 cities. Uh, this is the foldoscope, which I say, I think uh, most of people in the US know, which is originated in the US. It's completely made of paper. It's a 2000x up to magnification. It's of 8.8 .8 grams of weight. and they can easily fit in the pocket in the price, no personal powers, no personal source required, cost only one dollar. And uh, this is the guy who invented it, and uh, he said that it's a uh, uh, purpose of microscope for every child, and I would say microscope for every surgeon. And my, and my aim is to compare the images uh, of uh, splash cytology uh, done in the operating table uh, with the conventional uh, microscopic images, and also see the processing time that to talk now uh, how much processing time we can reduce uh, during the operating time. Uh, and uh, the splash cytology uh, preparation is not that difficult like closing section biopsies or uh, like a histopathology process. Uh, it's just like uh, fixing with the alcohol and staining with the and toxin, which, which uh, the material you can get uh, readily available wherever you go uh, and very affordable. And, uh, and this is the uh, polar scope uh, after attaching to the uh, uh, phone to a uh, uh, magnetic coupler. And this is the stain which I use in the operation table. And this is the conventional microscope where the pathologist uses. Uh, and uh, I like to present some of the videos here. Uh, this is the folder scope image. Uh, this is the uh, figure moid, it's ACR matrix. And uh, this is the conventional microscope. You can see uh, the sliding similar to that of the conventional microscope. This is a SLR matrix of the dermoid tissue. And uh, and this is a case of uh, glioma. It's a completely uh, uh, malignant uh, with a huge uh, nuclear SLR atypia. And uh, this is a case of uh, uh, low grade glioma. You can see the fibular matrix. Uh, the difference is that uh, uh, for uh, low grade gliomas, uh, uh, you can see the peripheral blurring because cells are very, very small. Uh, this is only 140x magnification. Uh, we need a little bit higher magnification to get a clear, clear image. And uh, this is a case of uh, pituitary adenoma. Uh, and you can see the compactness of the cells in case of benign lesions, uh, where you can get blurring of the images in the periphery, but the center is uh, adequate. Imagine. And this is a case of meningioma. Uh, this is a histopathology slide, not a squash slide. Uh, you can clearly see, appreciate the cell structure in the center of the field compared to the peripheral. Uh, that is the only limitation uh, is uh, facing with the folder scope. So what we did is an observation of how much intraoperative time we can reduce uh, in type two type three cities uh, using the folder scope because uh, with folder scope we can get at least uh, done in like ten to fifteen minutes and some images to any neuropathologist and they get the report back. And uh, 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 you can reduce the time around from 30 to 40 minutes. In some cases, you have to reduce it for one hour and type to type 
And what we did is uh, we, um, we have sent the images to three pathologists based upon their experiences. Uh, cases like GBM, gliomas, and epidermis, where the cell matrix is very loose, and when you make a splash light, the cells are easily separable. So that the two poldoscope lens, these cells can be clearly seen. But cells like uh, hemangioblastoma, meningioma, pituitarioma, where cells are evidence is very tight, cells are very closely packed and very difficult to see individual structure in this kind of uh, tumors. Uh, so uh, compared to conventional microscope, the foldoscope is very affordable. You can carry anywhere you want uh, and, and uh, maintain so very less and you can uh, do uh, in number of uh, slides. Uh, the main difficulties is the thing is the magnification where only the central field is visible and the peripheral area is very blurring. And also the panning of the slide is a bit difficult in the through the foldoscope uh, compared to conventional microscope. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the main other limitation I would suggest is this fast light preparation because uh, as a medical graduate, uh, we do in first year of uh, do these fast lights, but when we progress, we, we, we don't do these processes. And so we get less experience. So if we could have help of uh, what I did is I took the help of a technician uh, to help me preparation these fast lights. Uh, if we could train ourselves, uh, we could overcome this difficulty. But there are also difficulties uh, regarding the device. Uh, only the lens that is available is 140X, whereas conventional microscope, we have a 100X or 200X that you can change the magnification from pan sliding to narrowing the uh, 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 whatever area you want to observe. That is not possible with the folder scope. It has very good, uh, very gross uh, limitations. Uh, improvement of that device literally helps us to do a screening in a peripheral center, cancer screening in the peripheral center. We have like blood tests uh, to detect malaria, or the, uh, blood tests uh, to detect uh, some infection or fever uh, in the peripheral center. But when compared to when we come to the like surgical field, if a guy has, comes with some swelling or some uh, some uh, swelling disorder. When it comes, uh, it has to be removed by physician. He has to go back to an laboratory, get an anthanasic done, get the vast light done. It's like a very big process. We never, we don't have like a, a screening tool in a peripheral field. With this, if we have a, a, a if the surgeon is there, he took an anthanasic, they test well, then there itself, see the slides, get the opinion by the pathologist, and there itself get information to the patient where he can get care more early. These are the publications done through the foldoscope in various fields in foreign fields and agriculture and developmental biology and health sciences. The problem is that the research is going on and the research is like a patchwork, not like a uniform progress. Uh, everyone are doing the research and they're leaving it. They're not uh, going, uh, taking to a next step. Uh, it has a great potential uh, in various fields but uh, the amount that done in humans is very, very less. If we could use it uh, to do in humans and uh, see the potential, like how much it's uh, really helping in the peripheral field, uh, how much negative uh, information we have, how much positive information, how much thing we can improve, done it in global scale, it would definitely, definitely be a remarkable change uh, in the end. And uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, you can see the Aruku. Aruku means it's like a tribal village. Uh, it's around uh, 200 to 300 kilometers from the city I live. Uh, it's around the field top. And uh, it's, this research is done by a group of medical graduates. They went there, they did a cervical uh, smear cytology study, and they took the images of the uh, day itself and sent the images to us. It's a very interesting paper. It's presented by Githam University, uh, in, uh, in, uh, which is near, uh, near, near, in my, uh, near my city, and it's done completely by medical graduates. Uh, so, uh, what I want to say it is uh, to start like a global initiative uh, and to identify the universities uh, and that has to the community health centers in low medical, not in low medical, and also in developed countries and uh, give a universal protocol uh, to each university to get their own studies. And I request to uh, involve more medical graduates where we are, these are the workforce people, uh, where we can involve more specific specialties and we can see the foldoscope uh, utility in various, various other branches. And then we can draw a meta-analysis and then we can give 
uh, further ideas to develop this folder scope in especially in Fairfax Center to do a like a cancer screen tool. And I sincerely thank you very much uh, to Dr. Kipak sir for giving me this opportunity to present my idea. And I request, uh, I am ready to answer any questions and I'm very really happy to collaborate if anyone are interested to do their research, pick up this research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhavana, once again for that amazing talk. Um, I think it was extremely amazing to hear how such a low cost instrument holds so much potential um, to help stratify neurosurgical care and especially based on um, brain tissue samples, as you mentioned, especially in areas with low health care access. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm sure um, uh, we will definitely get to questions at the end of today's uh, webinar. Um, and so with that, I would like to transition to uh, introducing our next speaker. Um, Dr. Walter Jean is the Chief of Neurological Surgery at the Lehigh Valley Health Network and a board certified neurosurgeon with expertise in complex intracranial surgery. A native of Hong Kong, Dr. Jean attended Princeton University, where he graduated summa cum laude and Cornell University Medical College, where he graduated at the top of his class and was elected Alpha Omega Alpha. Um, he completed his neurosurgical training at the University of Minnesota and a fellowship in skull-based surgery at the University of Cincinnati. He has several clinical interests, including acoustic neuromas, pituitary adenomas, intraventricular tumors, and trigeminal neuralgia. He is also the founder of the Global Brain, Neur Brain Surgery Initiative, an organization that promotes sustainable international neurosurgical education, especially for complex brain tumors. This initiative brings leading edge skills, tech, and teaching to low and middle income countries to promote neurosurgical training. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Jean to share with us more about his work. Thank you for that. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thank you for that introduction. You had to dig deep to find that right up. My goodness. Uh, thank you for that. Let's uh, share my screen here. Okay. That's, uh, whoop, that's all the way. Hang on a second. That is not where we want to start. Uh, one second. Uh, sorry about that. That is the last slide, not the first slide. Okay. Okay. Um, are you seeing my screen? You're probably not yet, right? Okay. Well, no, hang on. Not just yet. <clears throat> yeah, I can see it now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, since we're short in time, we're, we're going to dive right into it. Um, I'm glad that Jim went first. Uh, I'm going to echo a lot of his uh, ideas and talk about uh, the tech. Um, here's my disclosure. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. Everybody knows that uh, we have a problem with not having enough surgeons. Uh, this is particularly, um, uh, maybe particularly true for neurosurgery. That's the Bogota decoration. Why Bogota? Because Colombia seems to be one of the worst off uh, countries uh, with access. Um, again, uh, here's how we can maybe solve this problem. We can reduce people who are sick. Uh, we can build awareness, we can build better systems and make more resources available. Um, we can task shift uh, neurosurgical procedures to other kinds of surgeons. And finally, we can train more uh, people who care. And uh, as part of Global Brain Surgery Initiative, that's what we're focused on. We're trying to do more the training so that um, we put out more neurosurgeons. Uh, and one of the things that we do, for example, is other webinars that, that Jim mentioned that are, that are kind of easy, low-hanging fruit to do. Uh, and we partnered with the North American Skull Base Society and had the uh, run with Surgeon's Law, which will be revived very soon. Uh, we also take the training all the way to uh, uh, countries. Uh, this is our mission in uh, July of 2020, 2019, just before the pandemic. Uh, we had a, five, uh, a team of five surgeons, uh, and we did a whole week of work in Panama. Um, and, you know, then, then comes the high tech. And wherever we go, we bring this uh, with us. Uh, I think we're also preaching to the choir what virtual reality is. Uh, obviously, it's a computer-generated 3D environment that we can interact with um, and turn black and white images into uh, three-dimensional images, uh, three-dimensional models we can interact with. And augmented reality is different. It's a cousin of virtual reality. It's technology that some 
that superimposes the computer generated images uh, onto the patients, uh, onto the user's visual world that we can work. And, and these are my kids uh, doing that uh, at home. If they can do it, then uh, we can certainly use the train um, uh, neurosurgeons around the world. So, so here's a system that I use day in and day out. Uh, this is a CTA that has been rendered into three dimensions. And then I can use it either on a 2D screen or put in my goggles and fly into the skull and uh, look at this ABM, for example, and or that particular aneurysm uh, to decide what kind of uh, clips I need and, and so on and so forth. So with that, so, so this is another example of that uh, particular aneurysm. So with that uh, system of virtual reality and that's coupled to with the augmented reality I'll show you, uh, we've kind of developed this system called Mentor. It's a maneuverable image, it's an erasable uh, model, navigable, turnable, optimizable, and resettable so that we can then use this to train uh, neurosurgeons around the world at home as well as abroad. So we, on these trips, this one is particular to Vietnam and Hanoi, we uh, bring this with us uh, to put their uh, students in here and talk about anatomy and so on and so forth. But, but we're really here today to talk about this. This is, this is from my friend uh, Cameron McIntosh's uh, work at Duke. So you, you see four pictures there and you see people in hollow lenses, Google lenses, uh, whatever you, you want, and you see people in one room. Uh, this will be very shortly uh, people in separate rooms, in separate locales, in separate parts of the world, maybe all the way across. So if we are able to do this, then we are really stepping up using technology to teach neurosurgery in the 20, 22nd century kind of way. So, and this is the slide I stole from Jim just now of, of how to, what the problem is, right? So we got, we have, it's a lot of very costly with connecting people that are very, very far apart. Uh, and again, you lots of Mary, lots of Hilton's as he said. So how do we use this technology to then mitigate this problem? All right, so this is the first paper that kind of just got my thinking juices flowing a little bit. We're trying to, you know, for the lack of a better term, dumb it down. And, and reduce neurosurgery, complex brain surgeries into uh, simple, simpler things. And I have a six-year-old at home. He, he does this with reconnect the dots and you draw an ice cream cone over there. Well, we can do this by connecting the dots, maybe uh, using this technology. So let me show you what, I, what we do. So the, here's a tumor, anterior uh, horn of the lateral ventricle, 60-year-old woman. We first put uh, a trajectory, we put a trajectory at the target, a dot at the target and a dot at the entry site, and we connect the two and call it a trajectory. And we know that if we follow this trajectory, we're going to find the target. So that allows us to do a very small opening to get to this target. So let's do it in real life. So the, the patient is locked in pins, very small opening, all we need is a small incision. And then as long as we can the focus the one dot with the other dot, line them two up so that you don't see the trajectory, you only see the a dot on the dot, then you know you're going to hit the target, right? So this is just very simple, connect the dot, uh, turning something relatively complex into relatively straightforward, and you find the target every time. Here comes the tumor. So initially, we thought, okay, that's great. These sort of templates and trajectories and markers and whatnot is a great way for trainees to generate these things and a teacher to grade them. Okay, before the surgery, okay, you, you, you did this correctly, go ahead and do the operation. You did this incorrectly, don't do the operation. Then they started thinking, now, wait a minute, what if the teachers and the students are far apart? And actually teachers generate this and then trainees from, I don't know, some Pacific island use the same system and they just follow the plan. So imagine if I had set up that trajectory and I say, okay, you, all you need to do is make an incision over this trajectory and just follow the, follow the two dots. And if they can see the same trajectory in anatomically correct position, all they need to is follow the preoperative plan, just like I follow the preoperative plan in my microscope in the local hospital. So let's, let's see how this may, may not work. All right, so you see an acoustic on the left-hand side of your screen there. Um, and on, on the right, you see the template that I made for this particular operation. The most important thing to note are, is the retro sigma opening, which is right underneath the purple line, the purple curve. And the yellow line, which is the, uh, the extreme of this tumor, and that is the boundary of your meato drilling. You cannot go any further than that because you will hit bad things, okay? In this case, the cochlear and the labyrinth. And that's all you need to drill because that's where the tumor stops. 
Now, I draw this as an instruction for my fellows, for example. They can see that yellow line as they drill and say, uh-oh, I'm not supposed to pass this line. So you can, you can ask them to do it and grade it. You can, you can do it and then train people to, to follow. So if, if we could simply export the plan and they see the same plan in their microscope in augmented reality that I generate, I don't really need to be up at night and midnight or uh, be there next to them or even on, on, on the lenses that the gym uses to really instruct them because I had a priori generated the plan for them. So another example would be something like this. So this is a, uh, a anterior um, uh, Meckel's cave tumor that we needed to do a little bit of coasis drilling in the middle fossa and it's a somewhat complicated operation. And there you see that the template uh, in living color and if you take away the tumor, you know, yeah, I thought we had the tumor. Uh, oh, well, no. Well, anyway, uh, if you take away the green, you see that there's a there's a blue line area here that I had marked out as the anterior pudicectomy area. So as you can see, there's a there's a green line that's the medial plane, all those kind of things. But all you need to pay attention to is that blue square that you know that this is where to drill. Um, so. Uh, simplifying a, a procedure that you can globally proctor, proctor across the, the planet. Give you yet another example. Here, here's a um, uh, tumor that we want to do a somewhat complex approach to. We want to go across the fox from the right side to the left side where the tumor resides. So again, we're setting up a trajectory on the long axis of the tumor, put the uh, target uh, there. This is where I would want to cut the tent because it's right in the, the intersection of that trajectory with the tent. And then now I'm fashioning a craniotomy for inside the craniotomy outwards in virtual reality. And this shows the trainee, wherever that trainee may be, where the bone opening needs to be, where the trajectory towards the fox needs to be, where you need to cut the fox, and therefore where the tumor hides behind the fox. All this is basically drawn out in living color, templated, exportable, um, and whatnot. So here's in real life, Here's the patient pins locked in the, there's the opening that you can see. It's simply marking the template that I had marked. I, I could be asleep, uh, you know, across the globe somewhere. You can do this. And then now one, once that opening, you see the, the two dots of the trajectory line up, boom. And now you know that you're going the right path. You follow that path down to the fox, and then you find the red dot in your augmented reality. Boom, there it is. You cut the fox at the red dot and the tumor is right behind the fox. And there you have it. So now not to belabor the point anymore, that's how we think we're gonna we'll work this with Thai Tech. So this um, uh, slide again, back to the train more care. And here's the, my, my ending slide, which is basically very similar to Jim's slide, which is to say the teacher and the learner you know, as you see here, is not really connected to each other. They're connected to each other only through smart tech and separated by the globe, by time zones, by uh, skill, by experience, uh, by resources, and so on and so forth. But this technology can connect them. So now, what's the big problem? Big problem, of course, is that we have to get this tech to, to them. And I am quite confident that, uh, you know, at some point soon, all, all this technology will be affordable uh, and, you um, at that point, uh, hopefully I'm still uh, around to, to do all this and push this further forward. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for uh, having me today. It's been a great pleasure. And every time I do one of these, I think of new ideas and, and come up with, with new things. So it's always a benefit for, for, for me as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. John. That was a uh, absolutely amazing talk and cool technology. And I can even see it playing out. I wish I had that for my own education. That'd be just uh, so fun to have. As a reminder, we'll have some questions um, just at the end here. Um, I would like to introduce um, our last but definitely not least speaker, Dr. Uh, Alex Colby, who's one of my bosses, uh, one of my attendings at Brigham. Um, she is the director of image guided neurosurgery, the co-director of our advanced multimodality image guided OR suite, um, and a professor of neurosurgery and radiology at Harvard Medical School. She has a Haley Distinguished Chair in the Neurosciences at Brigham. And in her laboratory, her translational research focuses on advanced imaging and image guidance to improve care for patients undergoing uh, intracranial neurosurgery. Uh, within that lab, she's developed numerous technologies that help guide pre-surgical planning and intraoperative decision-making, including uh, uh, increasingly recently some low-cost technology for neuronavigation that 
uh, yeah, we even get to use in our ORs. She was recently named a Fulbright Scholar um, and uh, uh, she was pursuing work to foster interdisciplinary collaborations between technical experts and clinicians uh, very recently in the host countries in Rwanda and Morocco. Um, so Dr. Gobi, we're uh, very, very excited to have you. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you, Saksham, and thank you um, all of you for inviting me, Ramya and Key. Um, so I, uh, as uh, sort of alluded to by Saksham, my background is, uh, and I'm just gonna pull up my slides here. Um, so my background is in um, very high tech neurosurgery. And um, it wasn't until relatively recently that I started thinking about how we might apply uh, technology towards uh, helping people in lower resource settings. And when I say lower resource settings, actually that includes um, sort of within the within the United States, most places actually are probably lower resource settings than uh, the Brigham and Amigo. Uh, so this was really driven uh, initially even uh, beyond the question of of global neurosurgery to how to do things in a way that's simpler um, and therefore uh, more cost effective, but also simpler for the surgeon. Um, so I'm gonna kind of zoom out a fair amount. Um, let me actually change this to the right kind of display. Um, so I just, uh, again, preaching to the choir, uh, wanted to talk about um, fostering medical innovation through interdisciplinary collaborations between clinicians and engineers. So the idea is that um, innovation, as Key said, can be low tech, it can be high tech, it's doing some, this, it's bringing new ideas and new ways of doing things to existing problems. And one of my um, hypotheses here is that the folks who are in the best position to innovate, what they need are the people on the ground, and specifically the clinicians who are facing their daily challenges. Um, so the the this is what I I proposed in the Fulbright Fellowship, and the goal is to connect clinicians who are intimately aware of what their challenges are and what the challenges their um, patients are facing are to engineers who can help them um, engineer solutions to those challenges. And by engineers, that can mean a lot of things. Um, you've, you've seen some beautiful engineering today um, in the form of augmented reality and the foldoscope, just amazing engineering. It can be computer science, it can be biomedical engineering, um, it can be you know any number of, of types of engineering. And, um, I just put this in the context of the sustainable development goals because I think um, fostering innovation and fostering collaboration across um, specialties touches on health, education, um, and then uh, industry innovation and infrastructure. Um, so I, as I said, I, I've been in the space of um, of the intersection between engineering and clinical medicine for a couple of decades now at the Brigham. And one of the sort of linchpins of that effort, which crosses across uh, many, many specialties is 3D Slicer. Um, this is open source software that's been developed over the last 25 years and is um, extensible and uh, can be used for both uh, teaching and um, uh, for guiding image uh, guided procedures. So it's a, a platform potentially that people can use. And there's, uh, you can see here a short list of different modules that have been uh, written. And I, I actually would like to just point out Slicer Baby Steps, which is a beautiful project um, done by some of our colleagues uh, regarding uh, fixing cleft feet. I'm sorry, not cleft feet club feet um, by 3D printing uh, very specific um, molds that are applied serially um, or sequentially over, over months to, to fix the deformity. 
Um, and I think that's that's just a beautiful example of a high tech being used to engineer a relatively simple solution that can be applied locally using relatively um, simple tools that don't require huge amounts of uh, training. Um, and just to uh, show that Slicer has now uh, over a million downloads, and I wanted to show specifically a 10 year change. So on the left is 2011 to 2012, on the right is 2021 to 2022. And what I was really impressed with was how some areas that are relatively underserved in terms of technology and specifically medical technology are uh, adopting um, and using the software. So uh, South America, Eastern Europe, S Southeast Asia, um, uh, Northern Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa, the Caribbean, um, the number of downloads are going up um, by a factor of 10 at least. And um, that tells us that, that people who have ideas are uh, reaching out, getting this free open source software and then working with it. Um, so, and my colleagues, um, and this uh, was funded by the Chan Zuckerberg uh, Initiative, um, have worked to uh, internationalize Slicer. So this is an effort to um, adapt Slicer to many different languages. Um, and specifically my colleague, Sonia Pujol is the PI of this effort. And um, she is happens to be bilingual French English. And so French is one of the early languages that's being um, used, but the idea is to create language packs that would work um, for, for users across many different languages. Um, and Slicer has formed the basis of um, an effort that's now been going on for uh, about uh, almost 20 years, uh, which is called Project Week. It's a hackathon, and it's um, over the last approximately five years been very much um, aimed at, at inclusivity and including specifically people from uh, low and middle income countries. Um, this has been facilitated initially by um, uh, actually our colleague Juan Ruiz Alzola, who is a graduate of our program um, and who is uh, a PhD science, computer scientist in the Canary Islands. And the Canary Islands are sort of directly adjacent to North uh, West Africa. Um, and so they have done a lot of outreach. Um, and uh, in reach. So the, the model that you saw about, you know, where are the trainers, where are the learners, um, the idea that uh, by locating um, a training site in the Canary Islands, it facilitates people coming from um, these countries to a relatively local place that's well connected with short and relatively cheap flights. Um, and these are the sort of number of direct trainees. And then the effect that was noted earlier, the idea of sort of second generation. So the, the, the project that Juan leads is called Train the Trainers. Um, so the idea is that people come and they can be trained in how to use the software in many different applications um, and then go back to their home countries. Uh, and this is a list of some of them um, and go on and train more people. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna sort of, it's, switch a little bit now and speak about some specific um, efforts that I've done. So uh, this is work um, that I did recently in, in Morocco, uh, where we uh, really tried to bring the clinicians and the scientists together. And this, I, I was really amazed at how fruitful and productive this was. I was also amazed at how little had, um, how little interactions uh, were the, the norm and the baseline. And I suppose it's, it, it's not surprising that I find it, that I found it um, surprising because I grew up in an environment here at the Brigham, which is incredibly interdisciplinary. We, we call it our secret sauce, um, this, this collaboration between clinicians and engineers. Um, I, I literally spend about half of my week talking to my colleagues who are computer scientists and, and engineers. Uh, but the vast majority of clinicians are not trained at all um, in these types of approaches. And similarly, the vast majority of engineers aren't being um, closely um, guided in terms of finding clinical partners. And so basically during this time, um, I uh, met with different clinical teams, um, asked them to 
come up with their needs. And this was well beyond neurosurgery. So for example, uh, we had very productive discussions with um, the pediatric ICU team, cardiology, ophthalmology. Um, the idea is really for them to come up with the ideas and then for us to facilitate and accompany them in their development of technology, which might um, help us with problems. Um, another way in which um, I think um, it can be very helpful, and this really builds on the beautiful work that you saw with augmented reality, is how to, how to de democratize um, training. And this was particularly apparent um, to me when I was in Mauritania and also in Morocco, because there's no cadaveric dissection. Um, and with no cadaveric dissection, we really need to help people learn their anatomy um, using these advanced tools. And, um, you know, I actually think when I see this, that um, even in places where we do cadaveric dissection, um, that's going to start to play a less and less important role, perhaps already does um, in our medical school curriculum, um, even in, in a place like Boston. Um, I also wanted to show an example of um, IGT, which is image guided therapy being applied um, specifically to create simple, low cost um, uh, approaches for a procedure. So this is work that's uh, spearheaded by my colleague, Gabor Fitchinger. Um, he and I um, actually have traveled together and worked together um, in uh, these countries and, and at Project Week. And he wanted to build a percutaneous nephrostomy um, uh, guide uh, based on ultrasound. So point of care ultrasound, I think, is a, is a low tech, high tech um, opportunity for uh, many specialties, including neurosurgery. Um, and I actually am spending a lot of my time on ultrasound um, because it provides real-time imaging. And um, as you know, a number of companies have developed low cost um, ultrasound. And this combines the kind of registration that you heard about earlier um, in a, a tool that was um, uh, built to be specifically to require very little infrastructure. So for example, um, it can be just placed in a in a glove rather than having to be sterilized or have a custom drape. Um, the cost per patient is about a dollar. There's no disposables. Um, in this case, there's no tracking markers um, and um, it can be made out of locally 3D printed um, components. Um, and he is doing this in, in collaboration with um, a urologic surgeon in Senegal. Um, and this is already being deployed. Um, this is um, to transition a little bit more specifically to neurosurgery. This is my colleague, Claire Karakezi. Some of you may actually know her. Um, I got to meet her when she spent um, several months at the Brigham um, as, a, as a visiting fellow. Um, and she's now back in Rwanda and my partner in um, trying to deploy some of our ideas. And I am headed to Rwanda in a few weeks um, to, to continue this. I, finally, I just wanted to talk very quickly about our, our navigation system. So this has a lot of similarities to projects that you've seen. It is specifically engineered from the ground up for uh, low resource settings. Um, and it's also engineered to be open source. So everything that we've done is designed to be freely distributed and can be um, used by, by anyone in any way they see fit, including um, their commercialization, um, if that's what they want to do. Um, in this group, I'm not going to talk about the benefits of neuro navigation because we've already heard enough about that. Um, but the cost of these types of approaches now is uh, between half a million and three quarters of a million dollars, um, also heavily dependent on single use and disposable um, 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 markers and other, other things more and more, as you know, is, is disposable. So um, our system builds on uh, consumer technology. So very inexpensive technology that's been developed largely for gaming. And this is uh, my postdoc at Chen showing um, how we can use this. So the, the camera that you see there is about a $2,000 camera um, and it's, it's not designed for medical use. Um, all of the parts are, uh, for example, repurposed camera hardware, so very inexpensive. Um, the entire system, including the laptop, 
can be assembled for about $4,000. And the software was built on Slicer, which allowed us to uh, take advantage of many, many uh, modules <coughs> that already existed. Uh, but it was totally re-engineered to be uh, very user-friendly and to um, essentially walk, walk people who may never have used a navigation system through every step from planning to registration to navigation. Um, and so we now have uh, made a few prototypes of this. Uh, this has been a very long um, uh, labor of love. Um, and so the, the first prototype was I dropped off in Rabat, Morocco. Um, and the second prototype is going to Claire in Kigali, Rwanda, uh, for us to continue to work refine and adapt that. Um, so uh, just to conclude, and I'm sorry I've gone on much more than my five minutes, but um, I wanted to talk sort of very generally that um, we can use technology um, and it's, it, I am a neurosurgeon, but I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit above and beyond neurosurgery that can use the same kinds of approaches, um, that technology can be really important for teaching, uh, for simulation, especially in places um, there may be limited access um, to um, the right material, whether it's a cadaver or a patient, and then for clinical innovation. Um, that uh, Slicer, which I um, was lucky enough to sort of, as I said, grow up in this environment, is an amazing open source platform that's been used by um, clinicians all over the world to develop tools for their applications. Um, and that basically, if we work together across areas of expertise and, and try to disseminate this, uh, we will allow folks on the ground to innovate solutions that meet their needs rather than um, completely just exporting um, our technology that's been developed in um, a very different setting. Um, and this is a sort of short list of uh, people who have uh, whose work I've talked about today. And um, I wanted specifically to make a pitch to those of you who do work overseas we're very interested in um, finding more partners who could uh, demo um, and test the, the prototype devices. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. And I really look forward to uh, a little bit of discussion if we have time left. Definitely, thank you very much, Dr. Bobby. That was uh, very comprehensive and uh, what an amazing array of technologies. Um, so we're going to get our featured speakers uh, kind of spotlighted on here and have a brief moderated Q&A. And then if people have um, any other questions, if you could put that in the chat box, we'll ask those questions right after the brief uh, moderated Q&A. Um, I wanted to start with one question um, that comes up a lot when we talk about uh, you know, novel technologies and innovations, especially in lower resource settings. And that's a, the question of um, sustainability. So a lot of the technologies that we hear about, uh, they're exciting and they're useful. But uh, many of them end up you know, gathering uh, dust in the hospital sometimes. And all of the innovations we've heard about today have been these great sustaining partnerships. Um, so maybe if we could start uh, with Dr. Johnson at the beginning and then hear kind of everyone's view on this. How do you make your innovation sustainable? Yeah, no, so I think that's a, a absolutely a crucial component of all of this. I mean, that's why this work that Dr. Golby is doing with the new NAV is really spectacular. I mean, to, to be able to, to leverage, you know, uh, you know, uh, open platform kind of software and and your your prior experience with navigation to to build a system that is essentially as functional as as the the more expensive commercial commercially available things. That's the kind of thing that needs to be done. So um, you know that we've always had a very um, uh, uh, you know focused approach to that exact concept. You're exactly right. Sustainability is is crucial. Um, you know the 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 a the augmented reality you know solutions I, I that we've always used and, and demonstrated with you guys has always been sort of you know the lowest level um, lowest bandwidth easiest to use modular kind of technology that that's that's available and you know fortunately all of these things are getting cheaper and cheaper as patents are are, are you know going out and and etc and more and more companies are getting into the into the the arena so um, I, I absolutely agree with the idea of of um, using judicious use of technology that um, you know is going to be uh, not too expensive. Like for example, these these smart glasses, just from our 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 work, 
you know, you can get a pair of those for cheaper than an airline ticket to, to, to travel to, you know, one of our partner sites. Um, and then uh, we have actually found them to be quite robust and modular and that, you know, we can, we can send them to one of our partners, they can use them for a while. And, and then, then once they're done using them, they can give them to one of their uh, partner hospital sites to do their own mentoring using their smartphone or whatever. So I think trying to use existing technology that everyone already has, like smartphones and tablets and, and whatnot, is a very important component of that, um, rather than trying to, you know, you know, th there are some really interesting companies that are that are doing cool work with building these um, uh, operating suites that have AR and VR capacities and those kind of things, which I think is an incredible you know, use of this kind of technology um, in, de in a developed healthcare system. But I'm a little bit more concerned about those kind of solutions where, you know, a hospital in a developing health system raises a bunch of money or gets a bunch of money from a, a, a well-meaning partner to, to build a suite. And then a year later, like you were just talking about, this incredibly complicated hardware is not being serviced or, or there's an issue and then it's not being used at all. And I think that kind of approach to being nimble and and updatable kind of technology that that rests upon already existing technology is an important thing. So, but I'm interested to hear what what you think, Dr. Golby and and Tyler. I mean, obviously, your space, you're in the middle of this as well. So, what what do you guys think about that? Yeah, maybe I'll just go next because I was uh, right after you. I, I echo what you said, and I would actually highlight, um, you know, what what Dr. Golby said as well. I mean, in, in my mind, you know, it comes down to uh, right, solving a problem that people want solved, and in a way that they you know want it solved. And so, um, um, I think you know, Dr. You know, Johnson, you hit it around the head when you said, uh, uh, you know, kind of leveraging existing technology either within the hospital or you know the I think the corollary or just natural progression of that is leveraging a solution that the hospital agrees upon or that the you know, stakeholders agree upon. So that's kind of what we do. We're not trying to build something and then say, you know, you have to use this. <laughs> it's expensive or, um, uh, you know, you have to change your protocol. Uh, I think it really involves like an adaptable tailored solution per uh, place. Yeah. Um, well, so, uh, uh, you know, Saksha, thank you for that question, which is, I think, a really a crux part of, of what we need to think about moving forward. Um, I mean, that really was the idea behind fostering homegrown innovation, um, that, um, that the ideas and the solutions come from people locally with resources that they have access to rather than being imposed upon them by us. Um, so it's, it's kind of an, a real investment in the future. I mean, I, as I said, I, I spent a month in Morocco, um, essentially talking to young people all day, um, young clinicians and getting them excited and also really mentoring them and how to think about a problem, how to think about what, what data you have access to, what materials you have access to, what people you have access to. Um, because one of the problems which we, we all had when we were young was being over ambitious, um, nothing like a few decades to knock that out of you. Um, so, um, you know, that, that really is the goal is to have people do, do their own innovation. And, and so you could say, well, so why am I making new nav, which is imposing neuro navigation, uh, a, a sort of US and, and Western Europe um, approach onto other people. And our goal really is to, to put it out there in the same way that Slicer was put out there and that people can do with it what they want, whether that involves um, using it just for planning, uh, using it for education, so loading their cases and then using it as a platform to talk to other neurosurgeons and get their thoughts about their cases, um, using it to guide um, craniotomy, to guide um, ventriculostomy, um, to guide endoscopy, uh, really to, you know, to, to shape it to their needs. Um, and then sort of beyond that, the idea of making it open source um, is that you know, some entrepreneur in some continent other than North America can take the code, can take all the um, hardware pieces um, and manufacture them or 3D print them um, and, and distribute it and uh, distribute it. And, you know, if they want to turn a profit doing that um, locally, 
we are, are totally supportive of that. Um, and that, you know, by if it can be made locally, then that really improves the sustainability uh, piece. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you all for that response. And one other question is, uh, you know, this is certainly somewhat context dependent, but what areas of technology and innovation uh, do you think need further exploration or merit further exploration? And that's open to anyone. Uh, I, I, I think the, like the, the area which I work in as a neurosurgery consultant, it's like a tight free city, it's about 100, 200 kilometers uh, from a um, uh, highly equipped uh, uh, hospitals where available. So most of the uh, patients who come to my hospital, I have to operate with the equipment which I have. Uh, we don't have like neuro navigation system or we don't have any like uh, this virtual reality, augmented reality, nothing else. Only thing I have to go is, is cure our environmental training during our university residency. Uh, if, uh, as, as she told, uh, if we have uh, the ideas and uh, resources to develop our own technology, uh, it would change and uh, impact a great, to great extent so that uh, some, now, this is the first time I hit this uh, 3D slicer and the new navigation getting it affordable at $3,000 is a very amazing thing. I, it's such a device available to at my hospital. I don't need to refer any complex cases to the Taiwan city. I can do it by myself. It's a it will be a great impact uh, for surgeons who are operating like me in, uh, in the city sector like, uh, type three cities. So maybe we can we can get together and uh, make you a pilot. Sure. sure. <laughs> what what one one thing that I would just say I, I really like this question as well. Just approaching it from a you know slightly different angle and maybe to be a little bit provocative. I mean I think that a lot of the you know current technology is great. I mean, I love <laughs> augmented reality. It's super cool. But at the end of the day, like a lot of these technologies rely on basic infrastructure, whether that's like network connectivity, power, um, or like other sorts of things. And so actually, I think if you, you think like root cause analysis or really like what's going to propel these technologies forward, you know, particularly globally, you look at all the challenges that, you know, every one of us presented and half the people are saying connectivity you know durability you know network reliability right all of those sorts of things and and so actually innovating i think which is much more challenging <laughs> by the way to produce a stable you know cellular network for an entire you know population but at the end of the day innovating on that scale actually i think really um uh, uh, uh would drive a lot of these other sorts of things forward as well uh the uh here in my country uh the problem is that uh it's like a uh if we wanted any like a neuro navigation or a microscope uh the companies where they made uh india uh they do that nothing but they import the technology right uh even though they import that technology there's no pressing cutting off uh, the cost price of the microscope or 3d navigation uh, the microscope normally costs around uh, uh, 30 to 40 lakhs in Indian currency, uh, which is the basic US version. Uh, uh, and the Indian made, uh, which is in, uh, the, 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 I think that they imported from the foreign country, which is the direction of only 10 lakhs price. But suppose if that a technology of um, uh, designing everything is available in India, I think we could make it available to 5 lakhs, 8 lakhs. Like an M surgeon like me, uh, with no background, we, we can purchase it. Uh, we can purchase a 50 lakh, 60 lakh microscope uh, or a neuro navigation or 3D system. It's very impossible for us uh, to purchase these cost items. Uh, these items are available only in Taiwan city, where by run by corporates. Uh, so it's uh, like uh, for young guys uh, who are like me who passed out recently, uh, they can't uh, set up a neurosurgical unit. It's very very difficult. Uh, for a young, uh, young people uh, to set up a neurosurgical unit for uh, such an investment of one crore rupees. Uh, suppose if the all the technology available in the their country, all the uh, technology designed by their own uh, I mean, uh, resources and the uh, own country, the price will be drastically reduced. 
so that uh, peripheral surgeons will be very uh, um, uh, very useful for them and uh, they can also set up their own unit uh, at the peripheral center this uh, this was, discussion was going on with me and dr p paksar in a wfms uh, conference uh, regarding this only uh, which i shared my idea uh, regarding the uh, creating a new small microscope uh, with uh, dr p park but uh, i am very fortunate uh, to share my idea here uh, uh, hope uh, it, uh, it gives a clear picture uh, to the uh, people out there what a young neurosurgeon faces the difficulties uh, to do any complex cases. Uh, we have to send the center to Taiwan cities, uh, like a skull based tumors, like uh, invading uh, the uh, ACOM immunisms or pituitary uh, uh, tumors or uh, in invading the ICS. Uh, we need certain, let's say, equipment like neuronavigation that's not available uh, where I practice. So I have to send it. Uh, suppose if it is available, uh, if the system is available at affordable prices, uh, made by Indian technology, uh, it will be changed completely, right? The patient no need to go to a higher center, no need to spend extra amount. Uh, he can get it done, bear it there itself, uh, because uh, people here, um, most of the uh, neurosurgery treatment is offered by the government uh, at affordable prices, because uh, uh, most of the population is like a middle Middle class, um, middle class population is a very, a very high number uh, compared to high class. With the high class people can afford this neuro navigation 3D system, maybe they can afford. But people like middle class people, they can't afford in the uh, Taiwan city. And the corporates, they bill it, uh, uh, that is not commercial with government. So again, the patient are turned over to the government sector uh, where they don't have this 3D navigation, not neuro navigation, everything. Again, patient uh, lead to uh, severe morbidity uh, because lack of facilities in the government setup. So if we could design uh, based upon the country needs uh, uh, to the price uh, to the, uh, the country needs, it would definitely change the patient life and also the surgeon life and young surgeons like me uh, provide uh, who like to contribute uh, or do service to the people. Uh, I think, I think uh, uh, if I may bring in one uh, point key, uh, you know, the, since this since symposium is all about technology and I think we're hitting some uh, conclusive points technology is expensive uh, sustainability is is therefore difficult and and hopefully things will get cheaper I, I think part of what we have to focus on is that the advancement of technology could potentially make it skip a generation of technology and therefore make things cheaper. There's an example that, that comes right to mind is I think that navigation is very soon going to be moving away from EM and optical tracking. And the Koreans and the Chinese are already developing this such that we're using augmented reality as its own navigation tracking system. What do I mean by that? So you scan someone with fiducials, you scan someone with a QR code, you, you can eliminate that whole expensive EM and optical tracking system and only use the markers to then track in augmented reality. Uh, you we, already do, yeah. we already do a little bit of this because, right, we already do a little bit of this because if the navigation goes off base, we use the, we use the uh, augmented reality, virtual reality models to, to track. So if, if we can go away with the expensive EM and go to cheaper AR navigation, maybe this, we skip a generation of navigation uh, technology. I, I think one of the key sort of takeaways for me has been really figuring out what the boundary conditions are. So, for example, with anything which is navigation based, how accurate does it need to be to accomplish the goal? Can you be one centimeter accurate? Do you have to be five millimeters? Do you have to be two millimeters? Um, I think that that's one of a really important boundary condition. Others are things like cost. Um, need for, for connectivity um, and, and, and similar, similar type questions. So for example, if you need to rescan the patient in order to scan them with fiducials um, or with a QR code, then that, you know, the boundary conditions where you want to, to implement that have to allow for an additional um, image um, session to happen. So I, I think if, when thinking about any of these problems, um, thinking about these, what engineers call boundary conditions is really important. And so, for example, Dr. Bhavana, 
with the foldable microscope, which or foldoscope, which I think is just amazing. My one of my big questions is what you started to do, you know, how much can be seen? How accurate is it? Because there's some limit below which it will cease to be useful, right? And so you need to make sure that you're above that limit in terms of its ability to resolve whichever features are essential. Um, and, and I actually had, had a sort of related question that I've been holding on to. So I'll just ask you, I assume that you're doing all the prep yourself. So you're, you're smearing the tissue, you're staining it yes, and, you're, yes. and yes. you're fixing it which requires, yeah. you know, requires a certain supplies and a certain expertise to do that well. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, initially, uh, we, uh, I, I tried to attempt it to do by myself. Uh, uh, there were there were over uh, staining or something, uh, some tissue get jumped up because uh, I was not right initially. So I took the help of the technician who was in the lab, uh, who do the smear, uh, smears regularly. Uh, with it, with it keeping on my side, I started doing the slides for myself. Um, but it, so was, it is, a, it is, it is a limitation uh, which uh, every surgeon required because it's not like a complex like a, a protein section biopsies or a histopathology preparation. You don't need the big equipment. You need two slides, eosin toxin, and then formaldehyde staining. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, you, you can do a basic splash cytology. Like an FNAC, pirate swelling FNAC, subcutaneous swelling FNAC, ulcers biopsies. The problem is that uh, in, uh, we don't have a peripheral cancer screen uh, technology to a surgeon. Whereas uh, you have uh, like an, uh, uh, blood investigations uh, in the peripheral centers, uh, they can get it done and they can mobilize to the city. But if a cancer patient comes like with, with the tongue ulcers, which are very common in my area, and uh, thyroid swellings, breast uh, cancers, uh, where they roam around uh, three to four doctors, there, uh, they don't, uh, they are, they advise to go to scratch, they won't get it done there. So they'll be again coming to Taiwan cities. Again, they'll be roaming over there. Uh, if we could get a scratch cytology there, there itself, uh, or develop a technology to get a uh, splash cytology there, there so the information the surgeon can give to the patient so that the patient can directly go to a cancer center and get into treatment. So we could save a lot of time uh, to the surgeon as well as to the patient. Thanks, Raman. You know, we could have this discussion, uh, you know, for, for much longer. What, what I'm learning is that this is an exciting topic. There's a lot going on. And, uh, we definitely should have another meeting at some point, <laughs> follow up on this. I just want to say thank you to all the panelists, uh, Raman, James, and Alex, and Tyler, and Walt. I've learned a, I've learned a lot. Special thanks to uh, Saksham and Ramya for excellent moderation. I just want to tell you in closing that you know, we have two, I'm the chair of the Global Neurosurgery uh, Committee for the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Jim is the uh, technology innovation team lead. And we're working with two countries directly. One is Afghanistan, the other one is Sierra Leone. And Afghanistan already has a couple of dozen neurosurgeons. Sierra Leone has zero. And I would love to see, you know, each one of your technologies, whether it's the foldoscope or the, uh, you know, the the, the uh, Microsoft HoloLens from Tyler, and you know, and then uh, Alex, your uh, news uh, nav, and Jim into surgeon, and and you know, your your all your technologies. And Walt, of course, you're, you're a heavy adopter. You've already integrated all these things into your practice and, and sharing your experiences and, and helping these countries uh, move to the next level in, in, in certain neurosurgical capacity building. But uh, thank you so much for, every, uh, for all your time. And um, thank you for all the participants for uh, attending. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>